And uh, we're going to start out by singing, Come Thou Almighty King. So let's pray together. Jesus, thank you for again for this day. And thank you for the opportunity to spend time with you and with each other. May we uh, be blessed by your presence and may we be blessed by our interaction with each other. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please stand with us as we start off our morning service by singing, Come Thou Almighty King.
song I want you to special music.
wonderful song. So let's pray together. Our Father, yes, a, such a, a wonderful gift of music from friends and, and, and artists and people who think deeply, love deeply, and experience you deeply in their lives. And so I just want to thank you for musicians and people who, who sit down and write music that I could not write and, and pen words and thoughts together that, that just overwhelm me at times. And this is one of those kind of songs. So thank you this morning. Thank you very much. We praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to skip this and go straight into my slides. This morning, we're going to begin a new series called Powerful Connections, and um, a series on building relationships with those who know and those who don't know Jesus. And I want to introduce you to, to a friend of mine this morning. This is Big Jake. And uh, Big Jake is uh, has three settings on him. And... Uh, Talk about power. So if I do this, that sounds like it's you know pretty powerful. But then he's got this, and then that's not all because he's got turbo. So if I had hair, if I had hair, he would blow it all over the place. So I wanted to introduce you to Big Jake this morning because. Um, he kind of illustrates, you know, this this kind of progressive kind of idea, uh, and especially when it comes to this issue of connections and powerful connections with people. Someone said to me once, and, and I've never forgotten it, this phrase, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And then something else came along, and, added, and I added this phrase to it, and who knows you. So it's not what you know. Many times in our society, we're impressed by intelligence and doctors and master's degrees and, you know, people who have extreme intelligence and can remember all kinds of facts. I came across on YouTube this week that you know that there are people who can remember, they have an, an uncanny ability to remember basically everything that's ever happened to them from a certain age, like in junior high. And uh, how many of you remember the girl who was in Taxi? The, 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 the brunette who was in taxi, I forget her name, Mary Lou Henner, she has this ability. If you ask her uh, on uh, May 13th, 1982, uh, uh, she'll go, oh, I was doing this, and she'll name it off, and she'll tell, oh, this is the day of the week it was. She can do, she, there, are, there are a couple of people, there are several people in the United States who have this ability, and so we tend to think of those people as being really, really, you know, impressive, Right. But in the end, in, in life, and I'm sure many of you would agree with me, it's not what you know, even though what you know is important, but it's who you know. And then for us, it's more than, what, more than it's who you know, it's for us, in many ways, it's who knows us, who knows you. So I, I, I wanted to give those to you this morning and, and, uh, and, and let you think about that. It's not what you know, it's who you know, and then who knows you. Now, I found something online that I thought you, might, thought you might find interesting. It takes about 40 to 60 hours of time spent together in the first few weeks after meeting someone to form a casual friendship. So I'll back that up and give it to you again. It takes 40 to 60 hours, not just encounters, but hours of time spent, time spent with someone in the first few weeks after meeting for people to form just a casual relationship. That's kind of a daunting thought. Um, and now one more thing that I thought I would, I would give you is um, how many people do you think you interact with on an average day? So I, I found this website where this girl kind of talked about, she was trying to figure this out, and here's how she figured it out. So on an average day, how many people, did, how many people do you think you interact with on an average day? Now, for some of you who are retired, 
and, and maybe you don't get out of your home much, and we're going to address that later on in, this, in, the, in the message. But for your average person, how many people do you interact with on a day? So if, let's say that, you know, you go to work, and at work, you might interact with about 13 people, your boss, some of your coworkers. Uh, some of you are shaking your head no. Uh, what is it, three, maybe two? Uh, but let's just say it's an average. Uh, you work in an office, and you're going to interact with about 13 people. You run into them at the photocopier. You run into them um, at the water cooler. So you interact with about 13 people at work, right? Then you go to lunch, and you decide at lunch you're going to go to some place like, you know, Panera or someplace, and so you interact with three people at lunch. You know, it's the cashier. You might run into someone who's waiting in line with you. So 13 people at work, three people at lunch. But keep in mind, this is this woman. This is how she kind of added it up. And then, of course, you might run into your spouse or parent. Let's hope that you might run, if you're married, that you're going to run into your spouse in a day. And you might run into a parent, so we're going to give you one there. So, And then, uh, let's say you decide to take the dog on a walk. How many of you have a dog? You decide to take the dog on a walk, and you go through the park. Uh, and while you're in the park, you might run into a couple other people. You might run into a couple people with dogs, and your dog, of course, wants to meet their dog. And, you know, uh, and that kind of you know, drags you together. So you encounter two other people on the park as you're walking along. And you might say hello to them, and you might greet them or something. And then let's say you're, you know, like me, you're trying to lose weight, and so you go to the gym, and while you're at the gym, and you're either, you know, doing aerobics, maybe you're doing, what's it, Zumba? How many of you do Zumba? One person in here does Zumba. Okay. Um, how many of you do aerobics? Wow, we're a sad group. Um, how many of you never go to the gym? Wow. <laughs> how many of you walk? Okay, there we go. I, I swim at the, at the Y. So at the Y, I, I encounter about four people. So we got 13, 3, 1, 2, and 4. And then the total of that is about 23 people in a day. <laughs> Some people are like, divide that like in six. Oh, multiply it by six. Oh, I see, for teachers, oh, I get it. But how many of you think of teachers as normal people? <laughs> see, look in the room. Look in the room. No. <laughs> okay, I had to do that because you hung me out to dry and threw me under the bus with that. So anyway, so just as an average, about 20, let's say any, anywhere between 15 to, you know, I'm not going to go on the high end with the teachers, 20, maybe 25 people in a day. You know, okay. So. Um, I want to read you an article that I took from a, from a 2015 from, from a website called Mental Floss. And here's what it says. And this is about, now I'm going to talk to people who are retired. Over the last 40 years, the American society has become less social. A new report, so this was in 2015, so we're looking at close to, what, seven years ago? A new report in the City of, uh, Observatory by an economist, Joe Courtright, examines our social lives and social capital, fo focusing on how socioeconomics, technology, and segregation, both voluntary and involuntary, have affected our relationships with those around us. Neighborhoods have become stratified by economic class and belief systems. In other words, uh, you know, you're middle class, I'm low income, you know, uh, <laughs> That's the, that's the Latin section of town. You know, we've become kind of you know, segregated. Um, and by economics and belief systems, especially political leanings, right? I wouldn't ask you to hold up your hand here if you're a Republican or Democrat. That would just not be a good thing. As a result, residents lose the opportunity to form diverse networks of friends and acquaintances, he says. Even worse, we're not talking to the neighbors we do have. Data from the General Society, Social Society shows that people are less likely to socialize with their neighbors than they were in the 1970s, when less than a fourth of the survey respondents reported no interaction with their neighbors. Today, one-third of us ignore the people next door. We trust each other less as well, which Courtright argues is both a cause and the effect of the disintegration of the public realm. People have fewer interactions with other members of their community, and that unfamiliarity breeds distrust. And because we're distrustful, we're less willing to invest in the public realm. It's a vicious cycle, Courtright also says. Our ability to tune each other out via technology 
contributes to this problem. While gathering around the radio to listen to a live event hasn't been common for a long time, we rarely even gather around the television anymore. Preferring to stream our media on computers, phones, and watching our shows on big screens enough for just one or two viewers. Or if you're like me, there are some times when you're walking along and you can see someone and they're watching their phone with their headphones and they've not got the ones that have got the you know, wires on them. They're Bluetooth headphones. And they're, you know, you could, I'll give you an example. I was at dinner last night with some friends. And across from us to the right of us, there were f- six, five people sitting at that table. Three of the people, three of the five, were on their phones almost the entire time they were having the meal. And two of the people were trying to have a conversation with the other three, and I don't know how they were doing it. So, um, we're in a society where we're disconnected about things. Uh, Do you know what one of the biggest things that has caused a problem for us? Answer this question. In the 50s and the 60s, where were, where were all the, the lawn furniture? In the 50s and the 60s, where was the lawn furniture located? On the front porch. Now where has it migrated? And, uh, and, and the backyard has also got what around it? How high? Six, seven feet tall. Many times. So, and then, and then on top of that, think of this for, for us. What's the easiest thing to do on a winter day? Drive home, hit the garage door button. The garage door comes up, you drive the car in, put the button, the garage door comes down, and you simply walk from the garage into the house, and you never see anybody. That's a very easy thing to do. And even on a summer day. It's very easy. It's, it's simply easy to hit the garage door button as you're driving down your, down your street to your home so that by the time we reach our, our driveway, by the way, why do we park on driveways and drive on parkways? I just thought I'd ask. Um, it's easy to just simply do that, and as, as you drive up to, the, to the, uh, you know, your garage, the, the door has come up. You simply drive in, punch the button, it comes down. And then you walk in the house and you never see anybody. Now, for those of you who are retired, I just want to read you the story of a woman who lives in New York City. Her name is Solange de La Paz. She mourns, she says, uh, the very mundane pleasures and rituals of her once active life. She's in her mid-70s now. A weekly manicure at the corner nail salon, Saturday excursions to Macy's shoe department. I miss going to Sunny Brunch on 2nd Avenue with my friends, she says. I miss going to church. About every three weeks, therefore, a home care aide who provides 12 hours of city subsidized, she lives in New York again, weekly assistance accompanies Miss De La Paz outdoors. They walk to the corner and back, perhaps a six-minute expedition. Other outings are largely limited to medical appointments with an escort from the social service agency. Unlike some homebound elderly older people, Miss De La Paz doesn't feel isolated, she said. Friends and relatives stop by between a son's and a grandson's visit from Texas or California. She stays in touch online and by phone. A hairdresser and a priest make phone calls to her and talk to her. A volunteer helps with grocery shopping. A pharmacy delivers her prescriptions. Being homebound in rural areas, the article goes on to talk about about Miss De La Paz. Being homebound in rural areas can be harder and even lonelier, it says. Even for Miss De La Paz, however, being inside the house all the time is stifling, she says. I'm confined. Now, here's the issue. Almost 2 million people over the age of 65 or nearly 6% of those Americans, excluding those in nursing homes, rarely or never leave their homes at all. Researchers recently reported in the Journal of the American Medical Association, internal medicine section, the homebound far out number, 1.4 million residents of those who are in nursing homes. So it's easy whether you're elderly or whether you have an active life It's easy to find yourself in a place where you're isolated. Now, I want to say something to you. If I can get this to change. This is a book that I have in my hand. 
published in 2000. And it's called, as you can see from the title, Bowling Alone. And the subtitle of the book is this, The Collapse and Revival of the American Community. And this man talked about, and this is a secular book, it's not a, it's not a Christian or a religious book. This is a book where the man began to postulate in 2000 where we're at now. And that, that increasingly the idea, how many of you used to be, belong to a bowling league or still do? Do you remember all the people that were there at the bowling league? John, you still do them, right? How many people are in your league, would you guess? A lot of people that you interact with, right? How many times a week does the bowling league meet? Okay. This, this guy postulates this idea that instead of bowling with leagues with friends, you're there bowling by yourself. Because the idea of getting together and spending time with people is getting increasingly hard. Relationships are the most important aspect of human existence. They are the currency of our lives. They are the uh, friends, family, acquaintances, relatives. These bonds are God's gift to us as humans. And it's increasingly becoming more difficult. Loneliness and difficulty. I have five children Two of them, two the, old, the two oldest boys were by themselves but now live together. Our oldest daughter is married and has a little girl. My, our fourth child, our daughter, lives by herself. She's in her almost mid-20s. And then our son, our youngest, is since 23. And he has roommates, but he's living in a home. And he, he works from home. He's one of these new people who are working from home. And so if you were to ask him about how many people he interacts with in a day, it might even be less than 23. And it's all online. And so I'm, I'm just trying to present this idea for you that relationships are the most important aspect of our lives. They are the currency of our lives. Our friends, our family, our acquaintances, our relatives, these bonds are, the, are God's gift to us as humans. Life, listen to me very carefully, please. Life is about people. Everything we do should be focused on enabling us to interact with people about Jesus Christ. That is the sole reason why we're here, is to interact with people. If you want to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 13, we'll do our scripture reading now this morning. Otherwise, it'll be up here on the screen for you. And I'll be reading out of the New Living Translation. That's a translation I'm going to be using much more frequently now for us, the New Living Translation. So if you want to look up here, you can. John 13, verses 4 and 5. If you want to turn there, I'll continue to wait. Has everyone got there? So it says, So he got up from the table, took off his robe, and wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with a towel he had around him. Jesus' entire life, from the time that he was born until the time he died, Jesus' entire life was focused on interacting with people. The New Testament records over 40 encounters with various people, both individuals and groups. And so I'm going to kind of delineate this for you right now. In nine cases, Jesus initiated conversations with people. The woman at the well was one um, that kind of thing. There, were, there are nine in, in, occasions in the New Testament where Jesus just walks up or, or somehow ends up having this one-on-one -on -one conversation with people, and he initiates them. In 25 cases, it was the other party who started the discussion, like Nicodemus. Jesus responds to other people's inquiries, too. The Pharisees come up and ask him a question. Uh, you know, He encounters the woman who's had the bleeding issue for a number of years. Um, so, nine cases, he initiates the conversation. In 25 other instances, the other party starts the discussion. Other conversations were triggered by third parties. Often, where did, where did these conversations take place? They took place everywhere. 
there wasn't any one particular place that Jesus had it, did not have a discussion with people. It might be at dinner. It might be at a, at a religious, you know, at the, in the synagogue. It might be while they're walking on the road. It might be while he's standing, you know, just he and the disciples are standing by, you know, and someone just walks up and begins to encounter him. Jesus, his entire life was all about encountering people. Some of them took place in homes. Mary and Martha and Lazarus' home. He connected with people's thoughts and feelings. He understood that new ideas needed to be connected with existing ideas and frames of reference. In other words, their past. And if, and, and if those conversations were to last, Jesus was going to have to connect with them wherever they were and from wherever they came to him at. He seldom pressed for any kind of closure or decision. Instead, he understood that time, like we said at the very beginning, the 40 to 60 hours, he understood that time is required for ideas to simmer and for people to own their own thoughts and to be able to deal with what he was telling them before they could act on them. And that's true for all of us. One of the things that Pastor Sipley taught me is if you're going to change something, you, it doesn't work very well. I'll, I'll give you an example. I, I, I know of a church where they, the, the, the pastoral staff decided they wanted to change the music, as is often the case right now in our day and age. They wanted to change the music. And so one Sunday they were playing hymns and using the piano, and the next Sunday they, that was all gone. And there, there was a guy here playing with a guitar. And that change happened so abruptly and so quickly that it did not go over well. So one of the things that Pastor Simply taught me is if you're going to change something that people are deeply used to or rooted in, you need to give them time and they've got to be brought into it slowly and surely. How many of you learned that with your children? If you were going to help your children learn something, unless it was just, unless time did not permit it, you were going to have to introduce them bit by bit into what the change was going to have to be in order for them to adjust to it. It works for us. How many of you would rather adjust to a change rather than just have it abruptly shoved on you? How many of you would like to adjust? Look around the room. Jesus understands this. We can learn from Jesus' example. Jesus knew how to take initiative. Jesus responds to the initiative of others. He does both. He starts the conversation. He also listens to the conversation and engages the person. Jesus left room in his schedule. This is an important one. Jesus leaves room in his schedule for interruptions by friends, acquaintances, people he does not know, others who are coming to him asking him for perspective and help. Jesus usually met people, and this is an important one, on their own terms and turf. Jesus was interested in establishing common ground with others. Jesus is the perfect example of who we need when it comes to engaging people and talking to people. You, you see on the back things I've taped up for you about what a good friend is. It's, the, it's, a, it's, a, it's a relationship is what it is. Jesus understands and knows how to help anybody who wants to have a relationship and not be alone. Jesus knows exactly what to do. He knows what to think he knows what to say. He knows how to listen. He knows how to show you that he cares about your situation no matter where you're at. Whether, you, whether you're interested in finding out more about him and what he's asking, or if you're just interested and need to talk to somebody, Jesus knows how to do both of those. Let's go back to John 13. Jesus not only spent time with people, he loved them and genuinely loved and cared for flawed people. Now, you don't have to turn there, but if you want to, you can. We're going to look at verses 6 through 8 in John 13 right now. So here we have Jesus is working with stubborn, impulsive people. Now, I can, before I read verses 6 through 8, I'm just going to make an admission. This has sometimes defined my life. Stubborn and impulsive. I, I will be the first to admit that and tell you. There are times when I think and I have thought, when I, especially when I was younger, that, that I knew exactly what, I, what was going on and I was right. I often find it with my children. I just have to admit that to you. Th that I, I was the parent, they were the child, and I dug in in that position. And I became stubborn. And, and, and the impulsive part, sometimes I think people think, 
I'm still a bit impulsive, and, and it may be that way. I do, I, I do realize that I can go from, shift from one thing to another. But this was especially true of me when I was a teenager. And, and so Jesus knows how to love people who are stubborn and impulsive. Let's look at this, verses 6 through 8. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, what are you going, why are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I'm doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested, no, there's the stubbornness. No, you will never wash my feet. And Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Jesus understands people who are stubborn and impulsive. And he loves them. He's not put off by that kind of a person. He is not offended at their curt, brusque manner. Now, here's another interesting one. Jesus loves deceitful people. People who will turn on him. People who steal from others. Has it ever occurred to you to think that from the beginning, when Jesus recruited Judas Iscariot, that he did not know what Judas was doing and the kind of person that Judas was? Because the Bible tells us later on, what was it that Judas was doing with the money purse? Because he, by the way, and that's another interesting thing, that the disciples decided and Jesus agreed that Judas would take care of the money. What was Judas doing with the money? He was stealing from it. He's deceitful. He's a thief. And Jesus knew this probably about him from the beginning. And yet Jesus loved this man. In fact, that's what it says. In the whole passage, in one of the passages about, about the Lord's Supper, it says Jesus loved them up to the very end and Judas is included in that group. Would you find it easy to love someone who lied to you and stole from you? But Jesus loves even deceitful and people who betray him. Jesus loves this man. Let's look at the verses. Verses 18 to 30. This is a longer passage. I'm sorry, but we need to read the whole thing. Verse 18, I'm not saying these things to, to all of you. I know the ones I have chosen, Jesus says. But, the, but this fulfills the scripture that says, the one who eats my food has turned against me. I tell you this beforehand so that when it happens, you will believe that I am the Messiah. I tell you the truth, anyone who welcomes my messenger is welcoming me, and anyone who welcomes me is welcoming the Father who sent me. Now Jesus was deeply troubled and exclaimed, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. He knows it. He knows exactly who it is. And he's not cluing in, letting Judas kind of clue in that he already knows. The disciples looked at each other wondering whom he could mean. The disciple Jesus loved, John, was sitting next to Jesus at the table. Simon Peter motioned to ask him, who is he talking about to John? So that disciple leaned over to Jesus and said, Lord, who is it? Jesus responded, it is the one to whom I give bread I dipped in the bowl. And when he had dipped, he gave it to Judas, the son, of, the son of Simon Iscariot. When Judas had eaten the bread, Satan entered him. Jesus loves people that even have themselves controlled by Satan. Then Jesus said to him, hurry, do what you are going to do. None of the others at the table knew what Jesus meant since Judas was their treasurer. Some thought Jesus was telling him to go and pay for the food or to give money to the poor. So Judas left, going out into the night. Jesus loves deceitful people and cares about them and interacts with them, has a conversation, shows that he loves them. Jesus is willing to engage anybody Finally, Jesus loves people who are overwhelmed by life's situations. Now, we have been talking about this 
in terms of the fact that life is not a glass half empty. And there's reason for us to be joyful and positive and overwhelmingly uh, looking to the future and saying our God will be able to do anything for us and overcome us. Our culture won't overcome us. But you need to understand that Jesus loves people who are overwhelmed by life situations. And this is what life does to them. Their glass is empty. There are situations in life that overwhelm anyone and everyone. It doesn't make a difference if you go to church or don't go to church. Life can get so overwhelming that that is what it looks like and it's what it feels like. Look at verses 31 to 38. As soon as Jesus le Judas left the room, Jesus said, the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory, and God will be glorified because of him. And since God receives glory because of the Son, he will give his own glory to the Son, and he will do so at once. Dear children, I will be with you only a little longer. As I told the Jewish leaders, you will search for me, but you can't come where I am going. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Simon Peter asked, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus replied, you can't go with me now, but you will follow me later. But why can't I come now, Peter said. I'm ready to die for you. Here's this impulsive man again. Jesus said, die for me? I tell you the truth, Peter. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny me three times. And you will say that you don't even know me. Peter ended up getting so overwhelmed by what happened that he turned his back and denied Jesus. The glass went empty. Jesus loves people whose lives are overwhelmed. Jesus knew that relationships were the currency of everybody's life and that in order for us to really feel like that life has meaning, we have to be connected to each other, to others. Jesus knew this. Other than the time that Jesus, there are only two times that Jesus was by himself in the New Testament. The first, of course, one of course you're going to say right away is the cross. He hangs up there by himself, even though there are many people around him. Can you remember when the other time when he was alone? In the wilderness. Other than those two moments, Jesus spends his entire life around people. Now, he goes off and prays up to a mountain by himself at times, but I'm saying in a general long period of time or something extremely overwhelming, it really only happens twice. For the most part, Jesus spends his life with people every time he turns around. So what, what is this all about? People, relationships, they are the currency of our lives. And now I want to introduce us to something that we're going to start working on and looking at. I want to introduce you to this. Who are your three? So here's what I want to ask you to do. For some of you, it's going to be a stretch. For some of you, it will be easy. I would like in the next five weeks, because we're, this sermon series is going to take about five weeks to get through, I would like for you to take in the next five weeks and ask God to bring three people, relatives, sons, daughters, husband, wife, friend, casual acquaintances, long time, completely new strangers that you meet and that you make an effort, listen to me very carefully, that you make an effort to continue to interact with on an ongoing dialogue, in an ongoing dialogue about their life and about your life with Christ. I want you to commit to praying for them regularly and that you will see and come to develop a relationship with them so that you can answer their questions, their questions about Jesus Christ, who he is and what he's done. We will put a board up next week in the, in, in the foyer there will be a board that's yellow, 
that will say, who are your three? With some Sharpie markers on them. And I would like for you to write the names, the first names only of the three people that you're going to be praying for. Now, you, some of you will say to me, hold it, wait. I, if I put the name of somebody and they come in and they look at their name and they say, you've written my name, your name won't be there. You just, I'm going to write this person, this person, and this person. If you want to write them across this way, you can, but I'm, just, I'm going to do it like this, one, two, three. And you're not going to put your name on it. You're just going to put the three people up there. And for some of you, a lot of the, the, the people that you know that you might write down might be your relatives, and I get that. But I also want to challenge you to meet people who aren't in your family. New people that you're going to encounter. And I want you to just write their three names up on that board. And I would like for everyone, everyone in the building right now, to find three names that you're going to start praying for and that someone can walk up to you and say, by the way, how is it going for your three? And that you're praying for them and you to have an ongoing dialogue. And I'll describe this for you real quickly so that you understand where I'm coming from. I went out to dinner last night with a, a, a friend, a, a person who fits this, this description, an acquaintance of mine. Uh, particularly, just did it on purpose, wanted to take him out to dinner. Denise and I met him and his girlfriend. And we sat for two hours, probably two hours, maybe two and a half hours um, in Longhorn Steakhouse. And uh, we talked about their lives. They told us what's going on in their lives. They asked us questions about ours. Um, they would, they would um, of their own admission, admit to you that they are unchurched. How many of you don't know what unchurched means? Okay. Unchurched definitely can be, you can have no, no understanding at all about who the gospel is. But mostly unchurched people are, are people who have some background. They went to church at some point and they've stopped. That's where this young man and his girlfriend fit. And we simply had a dialogue, a discussion, talking to them about their lives. And when, and when it, it was appropriate for us to talk to them about what Jesus had done in our lives, we did so. After it was over with, this is what he, this is what he sent me. Had a great time tonight. Thank you. For inviting us and spending time with us. Now, he's 23. She's probably 22, 23. There's a gap between us of almost 30 years. But it's that whole thing of sitting down and saying, you know what, I just want to, tell me about your life. Tell me about what you're, what's important to you. Tell me what you're struggling with. Tell me about your life. I want to know you, just like Jesus did. I want to know you. So as we get, as, as we come next week, the board and the board will be up for several weeks, and then eventually, what we're going to do is we're going to to put it in that enclosed green space out there. And I want people to be reminded as they walk by and they look, and as you come by on a Sunday morning, I want you to be reminded of other people's three. If you want to put your name with your three and you feel comfortable doing that, go ahead and do that. If you don't feel comfortable putting your name but listing the three, only first names. Only first names. And by the way, this young man that I'm telling you about, I've told him that I was going to do this. And his name is going to be on there. You know what he said to me? Thank you. Unchurched people aren't afraid of us doing this thing. You could say to your friend, by the way, do you mind if I pray for you? Most people I know go, no problem. Yes, I'd be glad to have you pray for me. And so in the next three, four, five weeks, find a way to put your name on that board or put the names of the three people that you're going to pray for. And we're going to commit to saying to God, Lord, work in these people's lives and let me share the 40 to 60 hours that it takes to get to know them in order that I might share the life of Christ as it naturally occurs in our relationship. Because ultimately, you know what unchurched people want to know? Do you know what bothers them the most about us right now? They think that we do a bait and switch. You're getting to know me because you want me, you want to push me into a corner and, ha and ask me the question. And most of them know what the question is. So many of them are saying, are you interested in me or just the question? And the more we tell them that we're interested in them, 
and we demonstrate this in our lives, the more willingly they are going to be to hear what God has done in our lives. And ultimately, they get to make the decision with it. That's what Jesus does with a deceiver, with a, with a, with a thief and a betrayer, and with a stubborn guy. Jesus is interacting with all kinds of people. There was a rich man we studied several weeks ago. He came to Jesus. He wants to know, what do I need to do? Jesus says, this is what you need to do. And, and by the way, remember what he did? He walked away. That's what the dialogue produced. He made no decision. He walked away, and we never know if he ever decided. Jesus loves people. And we should be too, by the way. I want to show you a, a video to, as we end. Um, and uh, before we do, I want to say this to you. We're going to watch the video first, and then we'll sing the last song as the benediction. I want to say this to you. The scriptures call Jesus a friend of sinners. Not, listen to me very carefully, within this context of this conversation that we're having. Jesus is called a friend of sinners, not a friend of church members. Do you all understand what I mean by that? Jesus is called a friend of sinners, not of church members. It is very easy for us, very easy for us. There is a stat that says within two to five years, most people who become Christians have this number of unsaved, unchurched friends. Zero. And so God looks at us and says, build relationships. Love people around you. Let's watch the video. Okay, so based on um, kind of the intro about um, from First John, I think it was, or John, um, and the Lord's friendship and everything, how do you take that, um, th that description of friendship and apply it to um, your non-Christian friends? Because I'd say, like, I live with my housemates who are followers of the Lord, and we have such deep, wonderful friendships, but I still have people from high school and other places that I care so deeply about. And um, so I don't know if any of you have personal examples of just deeper relationships with people who aren't believers, but I'd love to hear about that. I think of one friend uh, in particular that um, that I've tried to be real intentional about cultivating. It's a, it's a mom of one of our uh, kids. Uh, we have kids that are friends, and we've become friends because of that, because we've spent a lot of time together during play dates, visiting. And uh, they're actually a Muslim family. And uh, we're cultivating and pursuing that friendship. I, there's, a, there's a level that you won't be able to go past with a non-believer uh, because there's just that, um, that depth of understanding and uh, camaraderie as believers and just spiritual identifying, spiritually identifying with each other that you're not able to go there with non-believers. But with your friends that are not Christians, you can go deep, you can, you can go and pursue that. And one of the things that I try to do with her is uh, even though we have very different religious perspectives, um, uh, I'll pepper my conversation with references to the Lord. And I'll pray for her. Her little girl was sick. And uh, it's like, wow, what's going on with her? How, how can we be praying for her? And just reminding her that we're praying for them. We go on outings together. And while the girls are playing, we share life. What, how's your husband doing? What, how's his business? Do you, you know, do you think you guys are going to be able to purchase your house? You know, because of financial stuff going on. We've been able to share pretty intimate details to a, to a certain degree. But... Um, there's always going to be a line that, that's drawn with non-believers that, that we can't go past because there's just not that spiritual depth to them yet, that spiritual life that we can share. But, but we can certainly have rich friendships, and I think we should be pursuing those with What I love about that is I know, Lisa, your, your ministry to her flows out of your, your godliness, your relationship with the Lord, where you're not forcing it in in some strategic way it really is out of a heart of love 
because you believe what she needs most is to know Christ. And, to, and I think it's tragic the way we will secularize the way we talk to our non-Christian friends. Where, where the believer will say, man, God is blessing me. With an unbeliever, we say, things are going really well. With, with a believer, we'll say, we really believe God wants us to do this. With somebody else, we say, we think it's a good idea. It, it's amazing how we will just naturally secularize our way of talking with an unbeliever. Where I don't want my unbelieving friends to, to filter what they think and believe for me. And I, I would hope they wouldn't want me to be disingenuous in that way either. If this is really the, what I deeply believe, good friends will want you to talk about that and not you know, shape it all to fit more what they want. That's not what good friends do. And, and so I have friends who talk to me about karma all the time and, and all sorts of things I don't believe that they do, horoscopes and how telling that is about things. And, and, and I don't expect them to filter all that out because I'm a Christian. And, and I, my good non-believing friends don't expect me to do that. And, and it's, it's enjoyable, actually, when you don't have to always be calculating about filtering out what you really think. That's not good friendship. And I would hope they wouldn't want that from you. And so until we were almost 30, almost all our friends were non-Christians. And so uh, until we went to grad school at Wheaton, most of our friends were unbelievers. And, and it's been amazing how, how rich most of those could be and, and enjoyable they could be in spite of a basically different view of reality in many ways. My, I just want to comment and, and leave this by telling you this, and then we'll sing the final hymn together if you guys want to come up. Um, Ultimately, this is, what's it, this is what it is. I have struggled over my lifetime as a pastor with friendship evangelism because of this reason. Most people who develop friendship evangelism and use it as a tool for evangelism, the friendship ends up getting in the way, ultimately. If the friendship becomes very significant and deep, then the, the ability to talk about what Jesus is doing many times will compromise the, the relationship, it, it seems. And, and so friendship evangelism for most of my life I've thought was problematic. And while this may look like I'm doing a switch, I don't think so. What I think what I'm trying to say to you is, we can have relationships with people without building deep friendships with them. And there's nothing wrong with us coming up and talking, and, and, and we should have relationships with all kinds of people. It shouldn't just be our church friends or our relatives, our, our, our grandkids or our, our kids. We should not squeeze our life into such a small thing. Um, and, and God, once again, God looks at us and says, I need you uh, to value relationships with people wherever you go and whomever you can go and, and interact with. Is it work? Yeah. It's a lot of work to have relationships with people. Is life messy because of them? Yeah, it is. But they're wonderful opportunities for us to tell people, whether they're churched or unchurched, I love you and I value you. Tell me about your life. Tell me about your life. And when we do that, then they look at us and they say, well, tell me about yours. Um, there's the opportunity to say, well, let me tell you about what changed my life and what happened for me. Because God will give us opportunities because he used them himself. And I just want to encourage you. So in the next three to four weeks, come up with three people that you're going to write down on the board. It will be out there beginning next Sunday. And then eventually we'll, when we get done having it out for a while, we'll put it up in the case back there and you can look at it and see. And don't be surprised if I walk up to you and I say, tell me about your three. So let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for the opportunity to look at relationships and, and to realize the power of connections in our lives. And that just like you teach us to value and take the time to connect with people and to love people and to be interested in, in sharing our lives with theirs, telling them that they're very important because they are. Oh Lord, do not let us succumb to our culture's desire to hide behind our phones or our music or even the media that we can watch on our phones or to drive in the garage and close it and go in the, inside the house and never spend time with our neighbors or talk with them. Well, oh Lord, make us gregarious people who love to share you and our lives with them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Stand with me now as we finish off our service with God is so good. Have a wonderful day. Enjoy your Sunday, and we'll see you on Wednesday for a prayer meeting. Thank you very much.